Hey guys, it's Christina back with another video. And this week I have a guest with me. This is Ariel Basca. She is a, well, actually, let me, I was going to say she's a filmmaker, but let me, I usually let everybody introduce themselves. So go ahead, Ariel, introduce yourself. <laughs> Absolutely. So yeah, I'm a filmmaker. I'm a podcaster. I'm an author. I'm also a festival director. And it's in that capacity that I'm uh, coming here today to kind of talk about some exciting things I've been developing um, over the last couple of years. Cool. Yeah, I was wondering how long you've been how long you've been developing this. Uh, we're primarily here to talk about Access uh, Horror, which is a virtual film festival coming up. Um, as my audience knows, I, I love virtual film festivals. I'm promoting them as much as I can. Um, and so it's going to be a film festival uh, based around disability and horror. Um, but before we talk about the festival, I'm just kind of curious, how um, how did we get to this point? Like, Can you kind of tell me a little bit about your history and how that's kind of led up to now? Absolutely. So this is actually something I've been wanting to do even before I became a filmmaker. I've been talking about trying to create a film festival that would celebrate disability and horror. Um, this is something I, I've talked to a lot of my friends and a lot of different spaces about over the last two to three years. Um, and it wasn't really until January of this year, 2023, that I realized I might actually be able to pull it together. Um, I found the perfect venue where I thought I could hold it as a hybrid festival, first of all. And that made me feel like, okay, well, maybe I have enough contacts now that I can actually pull this off and have like the full on industry summit that I want to have. Because one of the things about the disability community in general um, that bothers me is that so often when we have celebrations of disability, they end up being just for the disability community and we can't get engagement from the larger community as well. Yes. And so part of the reason why I wanted to design this in the way that I did was to have really noted genre filmmakers come together with disability advocates and actually have to have the hard conversations. And it really is important to me that there be interaction because if there isn't, it becomes an echo chamber of the same people saying the same things mm -hmm. over and over again to the same audiences. And I really felt like for growth to happen, we need to have people actually talking with people from different backgrounds. And you don't see that happening at a lot of festivals. You really don't. Um... And so what are the current statistics when it comes to disability representation in film and TV, whether it's in front of or behind the camera? Yeah, so honestly, the statistics in front of the camera are pretty dismal, but the statistics behind the camera are even worse. Mm -hmm. um, so in front of the camera, um, technically, like when you talk about um, the state of representation on film, uh, in TV, most of the time about, I think that, I think the current statistic, uh, or the most recent statistics that are available say that, um, about 2.2% of characters that are on television are disabled, but 90% of them are played by people without disabilities, and so we've got a, a huge representation problem because so many people are being taught to crip up as opposed to having authentic portrayals of disability on screen. And then behind the camera, like it's the number I think from um, the WGA is 0.9% of writers mm -hmm. in the WGA are identified publicly as disabled. And that number is just unforgivably atrocious. <laughs> like mm -hmm. they really need to be doing more to commit to actually uplifting the work of people with disabilities as a whole. And 
you know, this festival is very much about highlighting the work of people who are doing phenomenal work behind the scenes, but also in front of the camera and uh, making sure that uh, they can be celebrated in the ways that are necessary. Yeah, I um, I was just looking this morning, I read, I think it was a, a New York Times article, I want to say from 2022, and it was similar to what you were saying. It was like 90 to 95% of characters with disabilities are portrayed by non-disabled people. And I feel like I've I've definitely encountered non-disabled people who are under the impression that disabled people get as many opportunities as non-disabled. And, the, you know, that's just not the case. <laughs> it's really not. And it's one of those lies that I think people tell themselves to make them feel better about taking mm -hmm. those jobs. And so it's it's it, interesting. It could, it could be either that or maybe they just hear the words, you know, inclusion and diversity and they assume that everybody is included but you know it unfortunately that's that's not always the case um, as our good friend p woodruff says you know the the thing is when people talk about inclusion and diversity really the the problem is that you know it takes checking a box to do inclusion and diversity mm -hmm. when it comes to other groups you know if you want to make sure that you have more black representation, more more uh, Asian American representation, more um, indigenous representation. You can just check a box and let in more people. But when it comes to accessibility, there also has to be more money included. It doesn't have to be massive amounts of money, but it does have to be actual consideration and resources put into disability. Uh, inclusion and people mm -hmm. don't want to have to do that and they don't want to reckon with that either yeah yeah to have those accommodations in place that you would need mm -hmm. on set um and you know primarily and and you can kind of tell me what you think too I kind of from the time that I've spent in the film industry I've kind of noticed there's kind of kind of two groups when it comes to uh to the disability segment of the entertainment industry. There's there's people like us who are into the horror, and then there's there's a lot of other people who are more into like the the positive rep representations of disability. When and how did you come up with the idea for the festival? Yeah, so it it's interesting. Like when when I you know you you use the term positive representations of disability, but the thing is that for me, horror is where I've always seen myself. Um, mm -hmm. I I will I will be quite frank. Like uh, when I was a kid, I was born with a disfigurement, and the right half of my face was blood red and purple, and I grew up with people who basically. I had bullies who, you know, called me monster face and pizza face and all kinds of things. But at the same time, my parents, I was an only child and my parents would only ever tell me I was beautiful and special. And same. <laughs> it wasn't until I was three that I had a bad babysitter who brought over a VHS of A Nightmare on Elm Street and mm -hmm. weed and her boyfriend and who basically, because I sat there as a three-year-old watching Freddy Krueger on film, I had a little bit of a recognition. Like, I I don't know that it was, you know, as intelligent as I'm about to make it sound when I was three years old, but I, I, I had this sense of recognition of like, oh, that's what people see when they see me. They see me as a villain. They see me as a a thing an other mm. a monster mm. and over time I actually liked that portrayal of me as Freddy and as a monster rather than the inspiration porn I got when mm -hmm. I was looking at other things that represented people with disabilities yeah. Yeah. <laughs> my parents showed me like the Eric Stoltz movie mask when I was, I don't remember how old, and I was so sickened that I was supposed to be a martyr. 
I'm supposed to be this perfect little person. I would much rather have the agency yeah, no, of being a monster. <laughs> But yeah, it's I can can do without the can do without the inspiration porn, you know. Um, and honestly, I, I I'm still curious exactly like what what some people find is the difference. Like to me, it's kind of like inspiration porn and positive representations of disability. Like how are those supposed to be different exactly? You know. <laughs> well, and the and the other thing too is that I found growing up you know, as I became older, that it was that you saw more representation of disability and horror than in anything True. else. And, you know, it's, it's very complicated. I think mm -hmm. the relationship we have with horror is very complicated within the disability community, because not all representation is good representation. Mm -hmm. But at least I saw myself there. Mm -hmm. And what I wanted to do was to create a festival that really forced us to have that conversation, because I think that's where the fun stuff lives in those kinds of conversations that force you to kind of reckon with this history of, mm -hmm. you know, looking at villains in a particular kind of way. And so our first panel of the of the entire festival is the history of horror where we are looking at villains and heroes with disabilities and how they've been portrayed over the years. Awesome. Yeah. I was, I was just about to ask you what, what kind of content the festival is going to include. <laughs> yeah. But, but that's, that's the first one. And okay. to me, like it's really important mm -hmm. that we're looking at you know, a very history so that we kind of know where where we've been that's led up to now and what what we're hoping to see in the future, how, exactly. how that would change. Exactly. And and the two days of the festival, July 8th and July 9th, uh, the first day is where we've been. So all mm -hmm. of the panels are organized around like where disability representation has been in horror and mm -hmm. Day two is where we're going. Um, mm -hmm. And so there are panels on day two that are like speculative stories to change the world, um, looking specifically at science fiction futures and how sci-fi and horror together are kind of changing the face of disability representation. Um, there's also a panel on COVID on film and in communities and how COVID on film has been changing the landscape for people with disabilities as well. And it's it's interesting to me because, you know, we've got some incredible creators who've worked with Marvel, Disney, mm -hmm. uh, you name it, but they're engaging in conversations that I've never heard people have mm -hmm. in a really large forum. And so, to me, it's both about the short films that we have as well that are coming from Fantastic Fest, Superfest Disability Film Festival, and Final Girls Berlin. They're really fantastic short films that we're programming, but I feel like pairing them with these deeper conversations is the thing that that really drives me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to get people thinking and to get change to happen so where where can we view the festival other than uh the united states yeah so the films themselves will be geo-locked to the u.s australia canada um germany uh greenland and the uk mm -hmm. uh specifically because that's where the filmmakers come from and so we wanted mm -hmm. to make sure that it you know, was representative of where our filmmakers were coming from. But then uh, the panels can be viewed from anywhere in the world. So mm -hmm. the panel ticket is $10 and you can view the panels from anywhere you are in the world. And additionally, um, every, all of the content will be available for two weeks after the two mm -hmm. days of the festival, specifically because we want it to be accessible for people who might not necessarily be around those two days. So yeah, we did as much as we can to make it accessible and affordable. 
Um, we also have an initiative that if people can't afford the price of the ticket for whatever reason, they can reach out to us and we will make sure that um, they have access to it. Additionally, for blind and low vision attendees, because we don't have as much audio description in the festival as we wanted to, there's free access for um, those attendees to view the films, so. Oh, okay, cool. Um, and so, yeah, actually that was gonna be one of my questions is how long is, is the festival gonna be available? But that's very cool. That's gonna be available for um, uh, a while afterward. Uh, so what are some of, what can you tell me about the uh, accessibility features? That yeah, have. so the accessibility features we're going to have are ASL interpretation and captioning for all of the panels. Um, we are also, and, and live, live cart captioning. Um, we also have um, one of the three blocks of films from Superfest Disability Film Festival has uh, audio description embedded, um, but there's also open captioning on all of the uh, films as well. So it's it's important to us to be modeling the kinds of inclusion that we'd like to see mm -hmm. in a lot of different spaces. Um, we are also trying to provide other things as well um, in terms of accessibility on the site um, and in the message boards that we're going to have embedded for uh, during the festival. But if there's anything that you would like to see that we don't seem to have, we do have a form for you to reach out to us and let us know of anything we can be doing better. Um, one of the things that I think is really important about accessibility anytime you're trying to build a festival like this is creating trust with the community, but also pledging to do better next time because there are things that we can't provide this year that we would have liked to. We would have liked all of our films to be audio described. We would have liked, you know, to have an app that provided additional captioning support as well, but there are only so many things you can necessarily do your first mm -hmm. year out, but we are we are working to kind of continue building the sandcastle. And will there be an inter interactive uh, tripping over my words again. Will there be an interactive portion of the festival? Absolutely. So every session is 45 minutes, and then there's 15 minutes in between each session that's basically for um, people to interact with guests or alternatively to interact with each other as they would like to. And so we've done that specifically so that people can interact on Zoom, uh, or through the message boards, or take a break from their screens if that's just too much for them. Um, and so in the interest of maximum accessibility and interactivity, this was sort of the best balance we could find. And um, so what is your, what's your goal with the festival? My big goal with the festival is really I mean, I have several big goals with the festival. The The biggest one is to increase visibility for the disability community as a whole and the importance of it in terms of engaging with people within genre spaces. I also want to make sure that people understand the crip lens, like the whole idea of what the lens brings when you have disabilities, what that means and how those stories are powerful and how important they are to the future of genre and to the future of storytelling. Because I don't think that's something a lot of people have reckoned with in a very particular kind of way. And I would love this festival to be a place where people really come to understand that. Um, I also feel like, you know, talking about advocacy for change in institutions is one of the panels that I'm most personally looking forward to. Um, and talking about really how we can create institutional change from storytelling. Um, because I think before we can have a social 
reckoning as a whole before we can really talk about, you know, how society needs to change as a whole. We need institutions to buy into this idea too. And so that's, you know, talking about law, education, uh, government structures, et cetera. We all know from the social model of disability that we really have to have buy-in from all of the structures embedded in our society in order to create change. And where would you like to see the horror industry in the next 10 years, let's say, as far as inclusion and representation? I mean, where I'd really love to see the horror industry. I mean, for one thing, you know, 0.9% of writers in the WGA identifying as disabled is really terrible. The thing that for me is important is that first of all, people are comfortable disclosing disability, mm -hmm. not feeling so isolated in so many ways and really embracing each other as a community within the community of horror. I mean, you and I know we met because of social media yes. in the pandemic and we Clubhouse, yeah. <laughs> gravitated to each other because yes. of our love of horror. Yes. We know the power of the horror community. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I was just telling uh, somebody that the other day I said, you know, the, the especially the horror, um, the disability and horror community is really small. You know, like, we all got to stick together. <laughs> We really do. We have to stick together. But I also feel like there will be greater representation and there will be more people joining our ranks yes. because of things like this festival. You know, my my hope is that people will look at this festival and either learn more about how to actually be an ally or alternatively will feel comfortable disclosing their own disability going forward and talking about what their needs are in terms of accessibility. And so where can uh, where can people find you? Where can they find the festival online? Absolutely. So the festival is at accesshorror.com. And uh, I would love it if you could go there and check out our trailer. It features the movie Freaks quite prominently. Mm -hmm. Um, additionally, uh, I can be found on, uh, social media as at just ask Abaska on Instagram or at ruin my sky on Twitter, but really, uh, I, t I tend to pretty much live at accesshorror.com all the time <laughs> these days. So anyway. That's so awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate you taking the time to to talk about the festival and, you know, we'll get, get the word out to everybody. On and thank you stuff. so much, Christina, <laughs> for having me. I appreciate yeah. you so much. Yeah. And it's so lovely to reconnect with you. And I, you know, I, I look forward to talking more about, you know, how you feel about the festival as time goes on. And I, I just I just appreciate everything you do so much. Oh, right back at you. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. And um, for those of y'all who are watching, uh, leave a comment if you feel inclined. Please give this video a like. It helps out the algorithm. And follow Ariel on social media. Follow Ac Access Horror on uh, Twitter and Instagram. And go check out the website. I'll, I'll leave everything linked in the description. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you.